way to do um, to have those words and have some audience participation uh, to hear about those songs and then sing them is a good it's a good way to go I enjoyed that um, and I don't know that I can hopefully just make a, a, a decent compliment um, to your message uh, with what I have here today I've called it sight and sound and I know that we are I don't know how you are I know that we're heading into just a few days away now from atonement we've already been through trumpets and to me there's always that it seems like it happens and, and we know that the, the holy days are divided there's the spring holy days and then there's the fall holy days and with, I mean with Pentecost kind of in between there but it seems like every year there's that there's that period of time leading into Passover and especially after Passover and during the days of unleavened bread when we we take you know we take that inventory and we we're kind of in a deeper sense of who we are and what we are, or at least what we're trying to do, and we, you know, maybe scripture means a little more to us and the things that we're doing in our life, and then there also is that time for me um, around trumpets and especially going into atonement and leading up to the Feast of Tabernacles, of course, as the climax, but, um, you know, as we're, I don't know, it seems like during those, that period of time, everything starts to, to, to come into focus a little bit, and, and when you read, and just like, Cody was saying when you take that time to be holy when you when you spend time alone in the scriptures and he made a good point about when you're when you're reading scripture you're taking that time to be more righteous and to be more holy and to, to work out your salvation and do all those things that we do so in a period of holy day seasons I think that I think we get a little bit of extra power there for one thing I think we are if we're if we're careful we can we can we can tune in a little better. We can have more leading of the Holy Spirit. So, um, and again, I don't know that you get those. I don't know that you get those feelings. But um, so we are going into atonement in just a few days. So I'm not going to ask you to stretch your stomach, because one of the things we need to be doing, I guess, is shrinking our stomachs down. Um, makes it a little bit easier, I guess. Nothing really makes it easy. Um, you know, I've had those atonements when it seemed like it was easier than it ought to be, because. You know, I don't. I've had I've had those atonements too, where the headache was almost more than you could stand, and I like it to be somewhere in between there. But I do like to feel a little bit of affliction. You know what I mean? Because there has been atonements when it feels like I got to them a little um, too easy, and of course, one in particular that was really difficult. But that's a different story. Um, I ain't gonna ask you to stretch your stomachs, but I may ask you to stretch stretch your imagination just a little bit, because to me, this is hard to do. I want you to imagine that you can, if you could only touch and taste and smell, if that's, all, if that's the three senses you had, you could only taste, you could only touch, and you could only smell, it was silent and dark because there's no hearing and there's no seeing. It's hard to imagine that, isn't it? It's hard enough to imagine not having one of those senses. To not ever be able to hear anything sounds pretty bad to me. And not being able to ever see anything seems terrible. I can't imagine. I can't imagine not having either one. But let's just say you could only touch, taste, and smell. That your world was silent and dark. Where would you be? In a spiritual sense, if you couldn't see, you couldn't hear. And I don't know why that question comes to me as I'm going, you know, past trumpets and into, you know, the Sabbath and then the, and the atonement and the holy days, uh, Feast of Tabernacles, first and last day and so forth. Where would I be in a spiritual sense without my sight and sound? It came up. Well, I think one of the things that you never know what prompts these things, but I know there was a conversation back here a couple of weeks ago. It came up again. It's the first time I'd heard the name in a while. I think it was Jeff was back here talking to someone about baby Pierce that we prayed for for so long. And it was almost a, well, she was a miracle. For as long as she was here and for as long as her mother and her family got to enjoy her and she she defied all the odds for a while, but finally... I had to give it up, and that's probably for the best uh, because we know that her best days are yet to come. But I think maybe that's one of the things, because Pierce wasn't able to see 
are not able to see very well. I don't know that her world was completely silent and dark, but then again, I don't know how, how well she was able to assimilate any information that her body, her senses could gather for her. I don't know how that whole process went, but again, she is at rest and, you know, her best days are ahead of her. I've wondered sometimes if being born into that situation, if, if to be born blind and deaf, or, to, or which would be worse, to be born that way or to have it and then lose it. But I'm thinking if you're born into that, you don't, you don't really know any different. You don't know that, you know, I, I don't know how the understanding comes, but I know that I have been fascinated, and I even gave a message here once about um, Helen Keller, and the woman whose name escapes me right now, who was her companion and, and done the teaching, and it's, the movie was based off of their their um, relationship together and the way that she taught her to read and, and different things, which is, to me, is amazing. When you think about a world that is dark and silent, you can't hear anything anybody's saying, and you can't see what they're saying. You can't see people. You don't know what colors are. You don't know what people look like, except for, you know, feeling and, and, and smelling and tasting. It's just... You know, that, it fascinates me. How, do, how in the world do you learn without sight or without sound? Without one, without one or the other, I can still learn, right? I can still, you know, they do it all the time. There's some really smart people who are either blind or, or deaf. With one, I can still learn because if I'm blind, I can still read. I can learn to read and I can hear. Um, if I'm deaf, again, I can learn to read in Braille and I can see what's going on around me. If the world were dark and silent, how would I know about God? How would I know about God? How, how did you come to know about God? Um, and if I could somehow acquire knowledge of the gospel without sight or sound, could I be deterred or swayed away? I think it would be more difficult if there was some way that I could come to that knowledge even if my world was dark and silent, I think I would be less apt to be deterred or swayed away. So much, brethren, and sometimes too much, is acquired. We received, we received so much information through our eyes and through our ears. And we, we process it through, through our eyes and ears, sometimes to our own detriment. There is so much stuff out there that stim that stimuli, I guess you could call it, that we, the stuff that we see and we hear, and you know, it, it's nothing, it's nothing new. There's nothing new under the sun, right? We have to decipher, we have to discern, and we have to make decisions on what we see and what we hear. And I'm speaking from a spiritual standpoint because there's so much stuff out there that we can see and so much stuff that we can hear we have to constantly be making those decisions. We have to decipher it. We have to discern it. Is this good for me? Is it bad for me? Can I learn from this? Can I grow? Because we pride ourselves. We pride ourselves on being the sentinels of our salvation. You know, because we do. Don't judge me. We, th we, t we talk about work out your own salvation, etc. Those things that we, that we cling to. So we do pride ourselves in being the sentinels of our salvation. It's, a, it's an important part of who we are, isn't it? I mean, isn't that, I, don't, I can't imagine what's more important than our salvation because we know that this is not all there is, that this is just a trial run, that it's a dressed rehearsal, if you will. I don't, I don't think anything else matters more. Now, I say there's nothing new under the sun, and the people of Galatia could be influenced by what they saw and what they heard too. And I say the people of Galatia because, to me, Paul does some really intense, some of the, my favorite of his preaching to the Galatians. And I want, with that said, I want you to turn with me to the first chapter of Galatians, and we're not going to read everything he had to say, but we're just going to read his opening comments, maybe even the opening chapter of Paul's message to the people of Galatia. Um, and I think if you take just a second to think about it and read it, then you will agree that there is some pretty stout teaching. Um, not that all of Paul's teaching wasn't, but he seems to be pretty focused when he opens the book of Galatians and he says, of course, introducing himself, Paul, an apostle, not of man, neither by men, he says, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him 
from the dead. Now, that death being not physically raising him from the dead, not a, 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 but like he did all of us, bringing us from that place of death, and shall at all the brethren which are with me unto the churches of Galatia. Grace be to you and peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world. From God the Father and from Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world. We just got done singing some songs about this gospel. About who he is and what he is and about being more holy and spending more time with him and and sinking deep in sin and he pulled us out and all these different things. And this is Jesus Christ who gave himself that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to, according to the will of his Father, our Father and God, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Now, just that opening is a, is a, is a powerful opening for this book of, of Galatia, or the book of Galatians. And Paul says in verse 6 that there is no other gospel because he says, I marvel that you are so soon removed. Now, if all these people were in a dark, silent world, this may, he may not have had to say this, but this is people hearing and seeing, being influenced by what they hear and see. I'm amazed. You know, I can't believe that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ and to another gospel, which is not another. There's not another truth, is it? There's not another good news. There's truth and then there's everything else. So if you're being swayed away, if you're being led away, and I can't believe that you're so soon removed from him that called you. So if you're being removed from him that called you, it's not just another gospel, is it? You're going away from the gospel. And that's what he's trying to say here, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. Now that doesn't happen today. There's not 800 different versions of the gospel out there, is there? Well, yes, there is. We have our sight and our sound, and we, we can be exposed to as much of that as we want to be. We can get online and spend days and days and days, and we can, be, we can go back and forth down all kinds of paths if we want to. I think sometimes it's okay to do that, but I think we have to stick to the trunk of the tree, and we all know that. We all know that we have to be the sentinels of our own salvation and be careful where we go and what we look at and, and you know, not being swayed by every wind of doctrine and that kind of stuff. But... There's not another. There'll be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we, Paul saying we, myself, or any of these other apostles, even what? Even an angel of God or an angel from heaven. If it were me or if it were an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you, then that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. Now, I think there's a warning in that for all of us. doesn't matter who it is or how long they've been in or how educated they are. He says, well, it doesn't matter if it's me. He throws himself right in there. Or an angel from heaven that teaches you another gospel than what we've already preached to you. Let him be accursed. As we said before, he says in verse 9, so say I again. If any man preach any other gospel unto you than that you have received, let him be accursed. For do I now persuade men... Or God? Is it me that persuades you or is it God? Is it God that reveals to us what we know and understand? Yes, we, we listened to messages, we read articles, we listened to tapes, we've done all this stuff, but who was doing the revealing? And that's what Paul's saying for, is it me that persuades men or is it God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. What does that tell us? Our message isn't always going to be real, well received, is it? Our example is not always going to be well received. Why is it all the, all the Psalms, when David and different ones are saying, they're stacked up against me, they're out to get me for no reason, it's not that I've done them any wrong, it's just that my enemies, they're, they're opposed, they're, they're coming at me from, and I've done nothing to them. But when I'm afraid, I will trust you. Just like Cody was talking about, Peter stepping out on the water. Anytime there's fear, if we look and we trust, then we don't have to be afraid. We sung that in one of those songs too. Not a thought or a fear, if we trust and obey. 
For I do now persuade men, or, or is it God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. We know that. We know that we can't, we can't change our message. We can't change our testimony. We can't change our lives to suit men. It's God that we have to please. It's God that we have to trust, and it's God that we have to obey. But I certify... But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. It wasn't man that gave me this message. We know Paul's story, don't we? Struck down on the road to Damascus, struck blind, the person who was persecuting and killing Christians. But I never, I never verse 12 says, For I neither, neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. We know that Paul, after his conversion, he didn't make a trip into Jerusalem from what we understand or, or assume, I guess from different teachings and stuff, was that he spent about three years in Arabia or somewhere. And, and afterwards, of course, he made a trip to Jerusalem and spent, I think it says, 15 days or something with Peter. Not to be taught of him, but just to be acquainted with Peter. Because he says, I, was neither, I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, except by the revelation of Jesus Christ. For you have heard of my conversation in time past in the Jews' religion, how that beyond measure... Beyond measure, I persecuted the church of God and wasted it. And I think there's lots of reasons why God chose Paul. We've all talked about some of the reasons that, you know, Paul was this zealous person and God knew if he's got that kind of zeal for what he's doing wrong, he could have the same kind of zeal for doing things right and different things. But I think this is part of Paul's story. I think that Paul was a persecutor of Christians, made his, made his ministry and his testimony and his teaching much more powerful. For you have heard of my conversation my conduct in times past in the Jews' religion, how that beyond measure I have persecuted the church and God of God and wasted it, and profited in the Jews' religion above many of my equals. Above many of my equals in my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous for the traditions of my fathers. They were wrong, but I followed them diligently. But when it pleased God, it's a different story. But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb, and called me by his grace. And he did that to reveal his son to me. That I might preach him among the heathen. Immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. I didn't go to Jerusalem. To them which were apostles before me. But I went into Arabia and returned again into Damascus. Then after three years I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter. And abode with him fifteen days. But other apostles... But other of the apostles saw I none, save James the, the Lord's brother. Now the things which I write unto you, behold, before God I lie not. Afterwards I came into the regions of Syria and Cilicia. I think he was there probably around 14 years or whatever, and was unknown by face unto the churches of Judea, which were in Christ. But they had heard only that he which persecuted us in times past now preaches the faith which he once destroyed. And what was the result? And they glorified God in me. You know, brethren, to, to witness and to know and to hear and see a man that you know once worked to destroy and now promotes the gospel. Now, that's a positive that's a positive campaign. That's, that's, a, that's a record you can run on, isn't it? And I know you're all tired of hearing that kind of stuff. But we are in a, in a campaign cycle, so that's just the kind of stuff we hear. But that's, that's, a, that's a record you can run on. Yes, I was this person. And if God, and I think that's why they glorified God in him, because he had that story. If he can do this for me, he was called by the resurrected Christ. And that's a distinction from the other, other apostles, isn't it? They weren't called by the resurrected Christ. They were called by him in the flesh. This is, you know, and Paul calls himself an apostle out of season or in, in different things. But uh, this is one of his distinctions. Our carefulness, brother, just like he was saying to these people in Galatia, we have to have a carefulness about what we hear and what we see. And we do because we have sight and we have sound. I think it's interesting, um, the part in, of Isaiah 11, which is a prophetic um, scripture, a passage about, of course, the coming of our Messiah, if you will. 
I don't have many, I don't have many scriptures here. This is not going to take me very long to get through this thought that I have. But if you turn with me to Isaiah chapter 11, you think about hearing and seeing, you know, it, may, it well, let's, let's read this uh, first five verses here of Isaiah chapter 11. Very, very familiar. Isaiah chapter 11 and verse 1 and says, There shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. And we know who that rod is, don't we, out of the stem of Jesse? And it says, And the Spirit of the Eternal shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and the Spirit of understanding, the Spirit of counsel and of might, the Spirit of knowledge, the Spirit of fear, the Spirit of the fear of the eternal, and shall make him of quick understanding, and the fear of the eternal, and he shall not judge. After what? He shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of his ears, but with righteousness. Now, we all know, brethren, that we part of our growth is us ob obtaining some righteous judgment, isn't it? There's nothing wrong. It says... You, you're going to be able to judge angels, and you can't judge these little matters, but there's a difference between, you know, people want to use that scripture, judge not lest you be judged. Well, that's not what scripture teaches disciples, is to be righteous judges, not just judging people on sight and what you see and what you hear, right? And that's what this scripture right here tells us. He is not going to judge by what he sees from his eyes, or he's not going to um, do it by the hearing of his ears. Neither reprove after the hearing of his ears, but with righteousness shall he judge the poor. And reprove with equity, equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. And righteousness shall be the girdle of his loins. And faithfulness, loyalty to that righteousness, faithfulness to his father and, and everything that he stands for. Righteousness shall be the girdle of his loins, and faithfulness the girdle his reins, not by the seeing of his eyes or the hearing of his ears, but with righteous judgment. Now, it begs the question, begs the question, can we invoke, can we invoke righteous judgment from what we see and hear? Well, we have to develop righteous judgment, so how do we do that? Well, not of our own, we can't. We cannot have righteous judgment of our own. Emotion. How what we see and hear makes us feel. That's a lot of times the way we judge, isn't it? Well, I heard this, or I saw this, or whatever it is. How does that make me feel? You know, and we turn it around in our hearts, and we turn it around in our minds, and we're trying to make this decision about what means the, what means the most of us from a spiritual standpoint. I'm working out my own salvation. I'm trying to reach a certain point. So a lot of times it's emotion, how what we see and hear makes us feel. Now, that can't be discounted. If we are going to exercise righteousness, if we're going to exercise equity, it's not sight and sound. It has to come from somewhere else. Because we are called to a we are called to a higher reasoning. We are called to a higher purpose. We have to be workers that need not be ashamed. You know, rightly dividing the word of truth into different things that the scripture tells us, otherwise we are easily swayed. He gives us the tools to stand fast. And Cody was in a scripture um, in Psalms, the 71st Psalm. I want to pick that up just to, for a second here. Psalm 71, Psalm 71 verse 15 says, my mouth, when I say he gives us the tools to stand fast, he says in verse, in verse 15, my mouth shall show forth thy righteousness and thy salvation all the day. Because I don't know how many days that I have. So I can't waste any, right? My mouth will show forth, and we can go back, you know, we can go back to the scripture in James. It talks about you know, the tongue and it being an unruly evil and all that. So we have to control that. Because it says if we can control that, we can control the whole body. This is one way to do it. 15 says, My mouth shall show forth your righteousness and your salvation all the day, because I don't know how many I have. I will go in the strength of the Lord God. I will make mention of your righteousness, even yours only. 
Now, it's like that other scripture I read here a while back and say, well, we've got that nailed down, don't we? And we're really, we're really accomplishing that. We're really doing that. Sometimes I look at these scriptures. My mouth will show forth your righteousness all the day. I will go into the strength of the Lord God. I will make mention of your righteousness, even yours only. Oh, God, you have taught me from my youth since I was a babe in Christ. And hitherto have I declared your wondrous works. And hitherto I have declared your wondrous works. Now also when I am old. When I am old and gray-headed, O oh God, do not forsake me. Not until I have showed your strength unto this generation and your power to everyone that is to come. Now that's a prayer, isn't it? Even when I'm gray-headed, don't forsake me. Not until I have showed the strength of, not until I have showed your strength to this generation and your power to everyone that is to come. How many times throughout this book, and sometimes it says it specifically, but it's always encouraged that we are to be sober, that we are to be vigilant. Not just here, not just here, but make noise. You know, we can hear. We do have sight and sound. It's not just taking in stuff. It's making noise. It's our testimony. It's being ready to blow the trumpet, being watchmen, using our example. Not just hear, but to make noise. Our testimony and our trumpet. Not just see, but project. Not just see, but project. You know, Paul, he said it because these people saw me as this person who once tried to destroy God's people and destroy the gospel and destroy faith. And now here I am bringing that testimony to you. Not just see, but project, and, and not just hear, but make noise. And sometimes we do both of those together. Because it says, don't just be hearers of the word, right? Not hearers only. It's one thing to, to listen to God's word and to read God's word, but then you've got to do something with it. Not just hearers of the word, but doers. You know, he doesn't reveal himself to us, which he has to do. Even if we were blind and deaf, if God wants us to know him, I still think that revealing could come. I still think that revealing could come. I think he very certainly could do that. And there's lots of examples in the Bible. God doesn't, like I said, he doesn't give, doesn't give us this knowledge and then cover our eyes and stop our ears so that we are, you know, we're contained. There's plenty of examples where he's opened people's eyes so that we know whether he was spitting in the dirt and making some mud and putting it on their eyes and telling them to go wash and come back and you're seeing. Or whether he just looked at them and, and rubbed their eyes and said, you can see. An unstopping people's ears that couldn't hear. Why did he do that? To let people know that I'm the one that opens ears. I'm the one that opens eyes so you can see and understand. So I don't think it even matters if you're deaf and blind. If I want you to see and I want you to hear, from a physical standpoint I can do it, or from a spiritual standpoint I can do it. He has to have that revealing and give it to us. We know that. But he doesn't reveal himself and then make us blind and deaf so that we can't go any further. Paul might say, oh, really? He did reveal himself to Paul in his blindness, but he had to get Paul's attention somehow. He gave himself for our sins, brethren. He gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world. We've sung songs here today, that is, and that was a, a great service. About knowing him, trusting him, believing in him, singing about the gospel, making ourselves the lower lights. That's a very good analogy. God's light's always there. Sometimes ours isn't so bright. He purchased our eternity. He wants us to see, and he wants us to hear, and he wants us to understand. He wants us to work. He wants us to cultivate the tools that he's given us to help us to stand fast. And we know, brethren, we see the days coming. We see that the day is already here when we have to be stronger. There's a scripture that says... That he comes, when he comes, let him find us so doing. He wants us to see, he wants us to hear, he wants us to understand. He wants us to work and cultivate. And I'm going to cut this a little bit short, brethren, but all I can encourage you to do is we go into these holy days. Um, we've already went into these holy days with trumpets. We're getting ready to go into atonement. It's, it's, again, it's a time of reflection. It's a time of, of thinking more and studying more and reading more and taking more quiet time so that when... So that we can do all these things. We can see and hear and understand. We're not, we're not blind and deaf. But just 
We have to be in a situation, brethren, where when he does come, he will find us so doing. 